The Sumerian pantheon was headed by an Olympian circle of twelve, for each of these supreme gods had to have a celestial counterpart, one of the twelve members of the solar system. Indeed, the names of the gods and their planets were one and the same, except when a variety of epithets were used to describe the planet or the god's attributes. Heading the pantheon was the ruler of Nibiru, Anu whose name was synonymous with heaven, for he resided on Nibiru. His spouse, also a member of the Twelve, was called Antu. Included in this group were the two principal sons of Anu, Ea, whose house is water, Anu's firstborn but not by Antu, and En, Lil, lord of the command, who was the heir apparent because his mother was Antu, a half-sister of Anu. Ea was also called in Sumerian texts N, Ki, Lord Earth, for he had led the first mission of the Anunnaki from Nibiru to Earth and established on Earth their first colonies in the Eden, home of the righteous ones, the biblical Eden. His mission was to obtain gold, for which Earth was a unique source. Not for ornamentation or because of vanity, but as a way to save the atmosphere of Nibiru by suspending gold dust in that planet's stratosphere. As recorded in the Sumerian texts, and related by us in the Twelfth Planet and subsequent books of the Earth Chronicles, Enlil was sent to Earth to take over the command when the initial extraction methods used by Enki proved unsatisfactory. This laid the groundwork for an ongoing feud between the two half-brothers and their descendants, a feud that led to wars of the gods, it ended with a peace treaty worked out by their sister Ninti, thereafter renamed Ninarsag. The inhabited earth was divided between the warring clans. The three sons of Enlil, Ninurta, Sin, Adad, together with Sin's twin children, Shamash, the sun, and Ishtar, Venus, were given the lands of Shem and Yafet, the lands of the Semites and Indo-Europeans, Sin, the moon, lowland Mesopotamia, Ninurta, Enlil's warrior, Mars, the highlands of Elam and Assyria, Adad, the thunderer, Mercury, Asia Minor, the land of the Hittites, and Lebanon. Ishtar was granted dominion as the goddess of the Indus Valley Civilization, Shamash was given command of the spaceport in the Sinai Peninsula. This division, which did not go uncontested, gave Enki and his sons the lands of Ham, the brown, black people, of Africa, the civilization of the Nile Valley and the gold mines of southern and western Africa, a vital and cherished prize. A great scientist and metallurgist, Enki's Egyptian name was Ptah, the developer, a title that translated into Hephaestus by the Greeks and Vulcan by the Romans. He shared the continent with his sons, among them was the first-born Mark Duck, son of the Bright Mound, whom the Egyptians called Ra, and Nin, Jish, Z, D, A, Lord of the Tree of Life, whom the Egyptians called Thoth, Hermes to the Greeks, a god of secret knowledge including astronomy, mathematics, and the building of pyramids. It was the knowledge imparted by this pantheon, the needs of the gods who had come to earth, and the leadership of Thoth, that directed the African Olmecs and the bearded Near Easterners to the other side of the world. And having arrived in Mesoamerica on the Gulf Coast, just as the Spaniards, aided by the same sea currents, did millennia later, they cut across the Mesoamerican Isthmus at its narrowest neck and, just like the Spaniards, due to the same geography, sailed down from the Pacific coast of Mesoamerica southward, to the lands of Central America and beyond. For that is where the gold was, in Spanish times and before. Explains why, the Adam, was created. For there was no Adam to till the land. Correct reading emerges, when, in the beginning, the Lord created the heaven and the earth, the earth, not yet formed, was in the void, and there was darkness upon Tiamat. Then the wind of the Lord swept upon its waters and the Lord commanded, Let there be lightning, and there was a bright light. I will produce a lowly primitive, man, shall be his name. I will create a primitive worker, he will be charged with the service of the gods, that they might have their ease. Those who from heaven to earth came. They landed on earth, colonized it, mining the earth for gold and other minerals, establishing a spaceport in what today is the Iraq-Iran area, and lived in a kind of idealistic society as a small colony. They returned when Earth was more populated and genetically interfered in our indigenous DNA to create a slave race to work their mines, farms, and other enterprises in Samaria, which was the so-called cradle of civilization in outdated pre-1980s school history texts. 
They created man, Homo sapiens, through genetic manipulation with themselves and ape man Homo erectus. Ordinary clay, it seems, has two basic properties essential to life. It can store energy and also transmit it. So, the scientists reason, clay could have acted as a chemical factory, for turning inorganic raw materials into more complex molecules. Out of those complex molecules arose life, and, one. From publicly available documents. But now it is also evident that when the mists of leaks, rumors, and denials are pierced, if not the public, then the world's leaders have been aware for some time first, that there is one more planet in our solar system and second, that we are not alone. The creation tales of Genesis are edited and abbreviated versions of much more detailed Mesopotamian texts, which were in turn versions of an original Sumerian text. The biblical tale of man's creation is, of course, the crux of the debate, at times bitter, between creationists and evolutionists and of the ongoing confrontation between them, at times in courts, always on school boards. As previously stated, both sides had better read the Bible again, and in its Hebrew original. And Cush begot Nimrod, he was first to be a hero in the land and the beginning of his kingdom, Babel and Iraq and Akkad. The location of this entryway was forgotten in the following centuries, and when the Muslim caliph A.I. Mamun attempted to enter the pyramid in 820 AD, he employed an army of masons, blacksmiths and engineers to pierce the stones and tunnel his way into the pyramid's core. What prompted him was both a scientific quest and a lust for treasure, for he was apprised of ancient legends that the pyramid contained a secret chamber wherein celestial maps and terrestrial spheres, as well as weapons which do not rust, and glass which can be bent without breaking, were hidden away in past ages. That the Bible's been saying so all along, clay being what Genesis meant by the dust of the ground that formed man, is obvious. What is not so obvious is how often we have been saying it to one another, and without knowing it. Let it be clarified here that neither the Akkadians nor the Sumerians had called these visitors to earth gods. It is through later paganism that the notion of divine beings or gods has filtered into our language and thinking. When we employ the term here, it is only because of its general acceptance and usage that we do so. That which for all time construction shall determine I have laid out, away from Eridu, where dry land begins, my quarters shall be, Larza will be its name, a place for directing it shall become. On the banks of the Baranu, the river of deep waters, will it be located, a twin thereof a city shall in future arise, Lagash I shall name it. Between the two on the plans a line have I drawn, sixty leagues thereafter a healing city shall come into being, a city of your own it shall be, Sherubak, the haven city, I shall name it. Mountain of the young gods, in the environs of Kadesh, and two peaks of El and Asherah, Shad Elam, Shad Asherath U Rahim, in the south of the peninsula. It was to that area at Mibak Naharam, where the two bodies of water begin, care of Afik to Hometam, near the cleft of the two seas, that El had retired in his old age. The texts, we believe, describe the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula. There was, we conclude, a gateway mount on the perimeter of the spaceport in the central plain. And there were two peaks in the peninsula's southern tip that also played a role in the comings and goings of the Nephilim. They were the two peaks that measured up. All that, however, was wiped out by the deluge. In its immediate aftermath, some 13,000 years ago, only the landing platform at Baalbek had remained. Until a replacement spaceport could be built, all landings and takeoffs of the shuttlecraft had to be conducted there. Are we to assume that the Anunnaki relied on reaching the site, tucked away between two mountain ranges, by sheer skilled piloting, or can we safely surmise that as soon as possible they worked out an arrow-like landing corridor to Baalbek? When civilization began, the gods who were worshipped, the focus of the act of being religious, were none other than the Anunnaki Nephilim, who were the source of all manner of knowledge, alias science, on Earth. 
There the original Sumerian epic of creation was translated and revised so that Marduk, the Babylonian national god, was assigned a celestial counterpart. By renaming Nibiru Marduk in the Babylonian versions of the creation story, the Babylonians usurped for Marduk the attributes of a supreme god of heaven and earth. This version, the most intact one found so far, is known as Enuma Elish. They recorded a tale of creation that matches, in some parts word for word, the tale of Genesis. George Smith of the British Museum pieced together the broken tablets that held the creation texts and published, in 1876, the Chaldean Genesis. It conclusively established that there indeed existed an Akkadian text of the Genesis tale, written in the old Babylonian dialect, that preceded the biblical text by at least a thousand years. Even more important, however, was how the silhouettes and shadows of the pyramids appeared to an observer from the skies. The true shape of the pyramids casts arrow-like shadows, which serve as unmistakable direction pointers. When all was ready to establish a proper spaceport, it required a much longer landing corridor than the one which served Baalbek. For their previous spaceport in Mesopotamia, the Anunnaki the biblical Nephilim, chose the most conspicuous mountain in the Near East, Mount Ararat, as their focal point. It should not be surprising that out of the same considerations they again selected it as the focal point of their new spaceport. Before the Incas and the Chimu and the Mochica, a culture named by scholars Chavin flourished in the mountains that lie in northern Peru between the coast and the Amazon basin. One of its first explorers, Julio C. Tello, Chavin and other works, called it the Matrix of Andean Civilization. It takes us back to at least 1500 BC, and like that of the Olmec Civilization in Mexico at the same time. The unique platform at Baalbek has been there from bygone days, and it is still there intact in its enigmatic immensity. Mount St. Catherine is still there, rising as the highest peak of the Sinai Peninsula, hallowed since ancient days, enveloped together with its twin peaked neighbor, Mount Musa, in legends of gods and angels. The Great Pyramid of Giza, with its two companions and the unique Sphinx, is situated precisely on the extended Ararat Baalbek line, and the distance from Baalbek to Mount St. Catherine and to the Great Pyramid of Giza is exactly the same. This, let us add at once, is only part of the amazing grid which, as we shall show, was laid out by the Anunnaki in connection with their post diluvial spaceport. Therefore, whether or not the conversation had taken place aboard a shuttlecraft, we are pretty certain that that is how the pyramids came to be in Egypt. It took man some two million years to advance in his tool industries, from the use of stones as he found them to the realization that he could chip and shape stones to better suit his purposes. Why not another two million years to learn the use of other materials, and another ten million years to master mathematics and engineering and astronomy? Yet here we are, less than 50,000 years from Neanderthal man, landing astronauts on the moon. <laughs>